who are the best? Like every, every team five years after it wins a, a cup is called legendary. <laughs> you know, it's, it's great, that great team, that great team, great player, great player, great player. Well, I'm sorry, not every team is legendary. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the boys to have. Books really saved my life. Ken, nice to see you again. Good to see you, Jared. Um, I was saying to you backstage that, you know, sometimes when we do events here at the Reference Library, people come who know a book really well or know the person really well, or sometimes people come who don't know the book really well. Looking around, I think you all seem to know the book and person <laughs> pretty well. But maybe to start, let's like, we can get on the same page. You know, I feel like hockey people know Scotty Bowman. Even people who kind of follow hockey more casually, like me, know Scotty Bowman. You know, more wins than anyone, more Stanley Cups than anyone. But I wonder if you can talk, if you can contextualize his excellence for us, just so we kind of know what we're dealing with here. Yeah, I think, um, I think that what I find most remarkable about him is the fact that in the nine Stanley Cups that he won, his first was in 1973 and his last was in 2002. So there's a 29 year gap between the first and the last. And that's a long time, <laughs> and, um, uh, and it's, it, it, some coaches last 29 years, not very many, but some do. But it's not just lasting and surviving, and, and if, you're just a, if you're just a survivor through it, usually you have these ups and downs and poor teams, and, but because you've won in the past, it's an excuse uh, to be hired with the next team, which isn't very good, and you work your way through, and, and then you, the, the string runs out 29 years later. <laughs> if you win one, and then you win one 29 years later, and it happens to be your ninth, it means that you've had to stay at the top all of those years. And that's really hard. And it's really hard because of all of the changes that happened in those 29 years. In his first cup in 1973 with the Montreal Canadiens, that 100% of the players were Canadian. They were Canadian born, Canadian raised. And, and the, the differences in, on that particular team, you saw them as whether they were Francophone or Anglophone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was about equal uh, at that particular time. By the time he had won his fifth cup in Montreal, and his last one in 1979, that by that time, I think there were three Americans on the team, and, and playing very modest roles, <laughs> and the rest were Canadian, and no Europeans at all. Then he wins in Pittsburgh, uh, 10 years, a little more than 10 years later, and at that point, one of the star players is Yaramir Yager, and he's a, a rookie at that time. And then there are a, a number of Americans on the team. And then by the time he wins his last one in 2002 with Detroit, there are all kinds of, I mean, there, the Russian five is on that team. There are a few Swedes. There are, you know, there are Canadian born players. There are American players on this team. The, the, the salaries that players would have earned in 1973 versus 2002. Uh, all of these kinds of circumstances, <clears throat> on ice, off ice. I mean, in 1973, basically a hockey life was an on ice life and almost, and, and mostly uh, um, uh, for a game and to some extent for practice, but then there was an off season and an off season was really an off season. <laughs> And, and you didn't go into the gym uh, during the season. And well then, all of those circumstances changed. And he had to find a way with dealing with all of those different circumstances and be at the top. And that, I think, is really amazing. Yeah, and that's demographics, <coughs> that's culture, but the game itself, too. I mean. Well, that's right. I, exactly, that's right. That's, <laughs> Something I shouldn't have forgotten, but did. <laughs> that's why I'm here. That, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of important. Yeah, I mean, when you once you start changing the nature of who the players are and where they're from, they they were developed in different ways with different sets of understandings and different styles of play, and so 
and then th where, where things really began to change was in the 1980s with Wayne Gretzky and the Oilers, when all of a sudden, hockey went from a game that was pretty much under control <coughs> and, and, and defensive first into this, um, you know, this, this, this chaos, uh, offensive chaos, which was, which was incredibly exciting. But again, you've got to find a way to deal with that. And, and if you are of a coach's mind and a philosophy that, well, you know, defense wins championships and we're just going to defend and we're going to go out there and win, you know, when that game changes that way, you're done. I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to compete. And so you better throw all of those wonderful philosophies that make a whole lot of sense to you when you first develop them and they read really nicely in the newspapers <laughs> and they make you into a guru and, uh, and all that. that's great, except gurus don't usually win championships. Uh, you, know, you throw the guru part out and you adapt. Well, I'm gonna jump in there because yeah. you said the word philosophy. And one of the things I love in this book is this recurring examination of Scotty's, at one point you actually say it's too basic to be considered a philosophy. Mm -hmm. So let's call it a method. Mm -hmm. What is the, so you just walked us through all those changes he navigated. Mm -hmm. How would you distill the Scotty Bowman method to do that mm -hmm. again and again? Right. Well, it's, it's just to, I mean, one of the, th I, I, I think I knew it before, but I came to really appreciate it as I was doing this book. Um, and, and, and that is that I mean, Scotty, for somebody who has had essentially more history in hockey than I think pretty much anybody, and more successful history, uh, you know, the, 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 and, and more success in that history than anybody, he's not, he, he's not a past thinker. He's, he, he doesn't have this incredible stake in the past where, where, where you, you could reside in that past, find comfort in the past, love the past, because the past worked for you, and it worked better for you than for anybody else. Mm -hmm. So why not live in that past and be the expert for now and for all time? He, he's somebody who, like, it, it's, it's um, and I, I'm not even going to, I try to get it across in the book. I hope I did to some extent. Um, but he, he sees every, every next game he watches, he watches as closely at age 86 as he did when he was 21 years old or 18 years old or 45 years old, as if he hadn't seen 10,000 games <laughs> before and as if the next moment he might actually see something that he's never seen before. And, 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 and by and being, being able to do that, I mean, that's what a coach has to do because things are always changing. Moment to moment in a game, period to period, game to game, month to month, the circumstances change. And if you go in with a plan, and, and you do start out a game with a plan, but if you're still holding on to that plan by the middle of the second period, chances are you're either having a fantastic night <laughs> uh, you know, or you're having a horrible night. Um, and you've, you've got to adapt. You're, you, you fall behind instead of going ahead or you're ahead three goals or you're whatever. You know, the, you're, the, the, you're in an opposing team's rink. They're on a hot streak. You're in a slump. You've got injuries. Uh, they've got injuries. You know, all of these things mean that you have to adapt to what you see. And so you never stop seeing. You're always seeing and then you're always adapting to what you're seeing. And so whatever else it is you have learned in your entire life, all of that is only at the service of adding to what fresh you are seeing at that particular moment. And, uh, and, and that's how he... Kind of works for life. Like it's a good well, it's <laughs> it's not bad. Well, you have it, you have it distilled. I in the book when I first read it, I actually wrote it down on this piece of paper that I still have tucked in my copy because I found it kind of inspirational. Know what you've got, get your players to do what they can do, and find a way. And that's yeah. basically as simple as it is. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 really like when he was in St. Louis as a coach of an expansion team. So. Those of you who aren't of a certain age that you don't <laughs> <laughs> and don't know of expansion, 
<laughs> but the NHL you know, went from six teams to 12 overnight. One season, six, the next season, 12. So all of these new, you know, these six new teams, they aren't like the, the Vegas Golden Knights that ended up you know, getting all kinds of good players uh, in an expansion draft. This was at a time when the, the existing uh, six teams sort of looked at these other guys coming in and saying, we, we had to pay the price, you're gonna pay the price of, of coming in here and we're gonna give you next to nothing. And, and, and now go out and play. And so good luck. And you're not only gonna to have to go out and play, but you're gonna to have to do it in the cities that don't have a great history uh, in, in <coughs> hockey. And if, if it may be a minor hockey history or a minor league history, but then that means having 6,000 people at a game or 7,000. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to have to have 14,000. And, and, and so he had next to nothing. So what did they do? And they, I mean, other expansion teams learned as well, but St. Louis did it better than anybody else. And so I was like, look, you know, I start out by feeling sorry for myself which I would because look at the team we've got, and he's coming from Montreal, so he <laughs> sees the you know, what, what might be, you know, and there, or what other teams could be like. And he's got to find a way of competing against them. And so it's like all of the things that you said to yourself, these guys can't play, they're too old, they're too injured, well, maybe <laughs> they aren't, and maybe, maybe they look. can't be, that's right. Yeah. And, and so the best example was in terms of his goaltending. At that time, you know, the, the goalies played every game. That was the idea, and if you didn't, you, you, you didn't play five games or something like that. And so, you know, the, the goalies that they had available to them weren't of a level that was going to keep them competitive, the Blues competitive, and so he said, you know, Glenn Hall, great goalie, but 37 years old or so. Hmm. That, this, he's too old <laughs> to be hey. an NHL goalie. Right. <laughs> Jacques Plant, too old, 38 years old. Well, they're too old to play a full schedule. Divide the schedule in half. Have each of them play half the games. Now, you've got something. He did that with, there's this, I love the, his Dickie Moore stories. Dickie Moore was a really outstanding <laughs> player the with the Canadians, yeah. yeah. And, and as much as he was a really good player, he was this great character. I mean, just as competitive as could be from, from Park Extension in New York, this, or in, in, in Montreal, uh, you know, this just hard-nosed Irish kid who just, like I, I think it was a talk about in the book, I mean, he would go after anybody and he would get into fights even <laughs> though he probably never won one. <laughs> and, and, but, but he was sure that the next one he the next would. One. He had a Scotty <laughs> Bowman mindset, yeah, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. So Dickie Moore by this time, he was, had been retired for a couple of years because he had horrible knees. And he not only had horrible knees from, uh, from hockey, but he had, he had had an industrial accident. He's the, like around the city and especially around Montreal, but even here, you see Dickie Moore rentals, that's Dickie Moore. He started that company, and I think, you know, that they started, he had, he, that he was working with a flywheel or something. It, you know, it flew off, smashed his kneecap, and this was after a bunch of knee injuries, so his career was over. Well, so Scotty Bowman contacts him and says, you know, like, what can you do? And so he comes out, and apparently for every, Dickie Moore would start in the middle of the afternoon and just ice his knees, ice his knees to get you know, two hours of action out of his knees, uh, you know, be dying when the game was over, and then ice some more, ice some more, <laughs> and then play another. Well, they get into the playoffs. He's their top scorer in the playoffs. <laughs> I mean, and, and so you, 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 you know what you have, know what you don't have, know what the other team has, and find a way. And so then you get into Montreal, and you've got, you, you've got the reverse situation. You've got all of these players. And how the heck do you coach them to be all that they can be? And then in Pittsburgh, is, I mean, one of my favorite ones is in Detroit yeah. in, in, in 2002. He had a team there that had, I think, nine, nine players who are now in the Hall of Fame <laughs> and a tenth who will be someday. The, the, the challenge 
was that only one of them at that particular time, in that particular year, was at his Hall of Fame peak mm -hmm. part of his career. All the others were past it. They were 35, 36, 37, 40 years old. They all had been, they had been captains. They had been the star players. They had been the go-to players. They had been the ones who were put in situations of you know, the, the important moments of a game, power plays, end of periods, end of game, all of that. Now they're all together, and there's only one puck, and only... <laughs> <laughs> this is the real yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, how the heck do you coach a team like that? And, and so all of them want to be out 22 minutes, 23 minutes, and all this. And the only way in which it worked and he knew that this, it could work this way, it is that if, if none of them got 22 minutes and they all got 16, and, and, and they didn't like having 16, but if the guy Not next the guy to them next had to them. 16, <laughs> and 16, and 16, then it was okay. <laughs> and if you only play 16 and you're 38 years old, you might not get injured. If you play 22, you're gonna get injured. And if you're, tw if you're 38 years old and you get injured, you're not out for two weeks, you're out for six weeks. And, and, and plus what he understood is that these players were at a stage in their careers where they, that instead of being sour, if they didn't play this larger role, they had gone through their sour period probably at 33 or 34. And now <laughs> having, Having this chance, it was, they were grateful. This was a chance at one final Stanley yeah. Cup that otherwise they would never have. And so they put together this team and it was, it was a terrific team. And, and, and that may have been, to me, that may have been his most interesting yeah. cup. It, reading the book, <clears throat> and I will talk in a second about the structure a little bit, but it focuses very closely on his whole life, but told in large part through the stories of eight teams um, in his life. Mm -hmm. And I was struck again and again, he, he's not coach of all of those teams, but you know, it's like so frequently the structure recurs where it's this rags to riches or extremely complicated problem, like inspirational story of everything being brought together and somehow right. working out. Right. And it's like skin of your teeth every time. And he right. finds the solution every time. Right. It's kind of like a thriller almost yeah. uh, in parts. Well, it was, you know, it, in, in doing it, it, it felt that way. I mean, and, and that, that what I wanted to do is because, again, nobody has been not, not only around hockey for that long, yeah. but up close. Mm. That was the point. He had been up close to all of this for really, you know, kind of well, from about 1947, when he was 14 years old, until now when he's 86 you know, years old. And up close in a sense where, where when he was 14, and this is, <laughs> I remember you know, when he told me this, I thought, oh man, I mean, if this isn't a gift from heaven, you're 14 years old, you're playing in Montreal. Uh, the Montreal Canadiens decide that they, you know, they're, they're trying to build up this sponsorship system with, uh, in minor hockey. And they ask you to, if you want to play for, the, for a Montreal Canadian sponsored team. They, the, the perk, there are two perks. One of them, which seems pretty nice at that moment, you get a new pair of pants. <laughs> that was, you know, the hockey pants. Score. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is that he got a, a pass, yeah. a standing room pass to the Montreal Forum. So he could go to any game, any event the Montreal Forum. He's living in Verdun. Uh, he can take, by, by age 14, he's old enough to get on the 58 bus in Verdun that winds through Verdun up the Atwater Hill. What's at the top of the Atwater Hill? The Montreal Forum. And, and, and the Montreal Canadiens play at home every Saturday night. Saturday night, doesn't get in the way of anything. You don't have school the next day. You can get up for church. That's, you know, that's not a problem. It's not as if there is homework, and it's not as if he's te his team is going to be playing. So he can go and watch those, those games every Saturday night, as well as potentially a Thursday night or some other night that they may be playing. 
So he literally is there. I think it was maybe two years, maybe three years after Maurice Richard scored his 50 goals in 50 games, and he was still at the peak of his career. He's there watching him at the peak. He watches Gordy Howe at age 17 enter the National Hockey League and watches him go from this raw bone kid from Floral, Saskatchewan to get better and better and then just dominate. And he watches all of these things happen up close, you know, all of that time and right all the way, you know, through all of this. And now I can't even remember what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't even a question. <laughs> well, okay, tell us a little bit about this structure, these teams, oh, yeah. okay. how you pick these uh, teams. Yes. So, so then it was like, if, if, if he's seen all of this, <laughs> then who are the best? Like, every, every team, five years after it wins a, a cup, is called legendary. <laughs> you know, it's, it's great, that great team, that great team, great player, great player, great player. Well, I'm sorry, not every team is legendary, and not every player is great. And so let's differentiate here. You know, let's separate the, the great, the truly great, from the great, the near great, the not really great. Let's, let's sort it out here. <laughs> the overhyped. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and so, okay, who are the best eight teams of all time? And, and, and to ask them that, so that we, you know, eight being the magic number, because it would be, I wanted a number of teams, but also then to have playoffs. <laughs> Set those eight teams against each other. You've seen them all. You've coached some of them. You've coached against lots of others of them. And so set them against each other. And what that will do is that will, it will get you to be the coach. Because that's who you are. That's how you think. That's how you approach things. That's how your mind works. That's how you, you demonstrate your mind and, 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 and your specialness. And so be the coach again. And instead of being, and, and I mean, sort of the interesting, and I hadn't thought of it this way, but is that what it also does is that it takes him out of the past. Even though these teams are from the past, the challenge is a present one because it's now setting these teams against each other and applying this coach's mind and coach's approach in the present. You're, you're watching this 84, 85, 86-year-old mind at work figuring out a new puzzle. He never had to figure out that puzzle when he was 35 <laughs> years old or 55 years old. He has to figure out that puzzle now. And so it is, you know, that it, it, it is much, it, it's different than most um, um, sort of biographies in a way where it's kind of war stories and everything out of the past. It is, it is taking the past <clears throat> but applying it into the present. And, and making it present oriented. And, uh, and so it was to get him, okay, you're the coach. <laughs> How would you coach this team? What, you know, who's on it? How would you do it? What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? You know, Gordie Howe was not, he had bad games. When did he have bad games? How did those bad games come about? If you were a coach, how would you try to bring out a bad game in Gordie Howe? If you were his coach, how would you prevent a bad game from happening. And to do this again and again with these teams. But as you're saying, I mean, in, in terms of the, of the, of the uh, 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 sort of the, the thriller part of it, yeah. is that I had no idea, first of all, which eight teams. They were his eight teams. They weren't mine at all. And then once he had the eight, then it was up to him to set the matchups. And all he said <laughs> is, that, is that, you know, that, that what, all you need to know is who your winner is and probably who your finalist you know, is right now so that you can set the matchups in a way where y your winner you know, is going to be in the finals. And, 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 and so know that going in. But otherwise, who might be interesting teams to play against yeah. each other? And, and, and so once he had chosen the eight, there were a couple of them that I was surprised with. Care to say? Um, well, I thought, 
I thought that um, he had the Leafs of 63, and I thought it might be the Leafs of the late 40s. Hmm. Uh, that was one. There was another, and, and another was, I wasn't sure about Chicago in the last decade. I mean, Pittsburgh would be a candidate. Uh, and again, the, the, the thing with Scotty, you're saying to him, is that I want the eight best, not a representative eight best, yeah. not a, you know, an appropriate selection that is a divide between you know, Canadian and American teams and, and uh, uh, pre-1967, post. No, no, no. You, you don't have an obligation to be nice about all of this. Your obligation is to choose the best, whoever the best are. And the only thing that I said to him is when you had a team that was a, a, a dynasty where it would win three yeah. in a row, five in a row, four in a row, something Choose the, choose the team out of those three or four in a row that you think is the best. Don't choose two of them. Choose, choose one of them. Uh, and, and, then, and then, like, I, we, we'd get into this, and, and I'd get a little nervous. I mean, <laughs> because we'd start a conversation. It's okay. Today, it's blank against blank. So, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, well, there's this and that and that. And, 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 and especially as it would get down from the eight then to the four, and then the four to the two, and then the two to the one. And, and it, you know, it's, it, it's kind of nervous making. Yeah, and I remember you saying when he first gave you the eight and then showed you the bracket, you know, or kind of right. a, you, I remember you saying you were surprised because there, was, there were matchups where you thought, I thought both of these teams could have been in the final. That's right. I mean, I, I, that, that, uh, I, I won't go into this, yeah, no spoilers. With, with, but, but I'll, I'll give you just one example. Uh, I mean, the, the Montreal Canadiens from 1956 to 1960 won five straight Stanley Cups. The Detroit Red Wings of the early 1950s won three and maybe five years, but they, had been, they, they finished in first place for seven straight years. And, and, and after he talked about, you know, we, what we would do is we would talk about these eight teams before imagining what the matchups might be. So then it's the time to, for, the, for the matchups. And after I've heard him talk about each of these eight teams, I'm thinking, boy, I knew that the 56 to 60 Canadians had to be up there and yeah. we're, we're going to advance well along the way. But the Detroit team, the way he talks about them, <laughs> geez, I didn't know much about them before, but they're, and, and he has them against each other Someone's in the first round. Home. It's like, holy cow, one of them is <laughs> gone right away. And these are two teams that, that I would have guessed beforehand would have both been in the semifinals and potentially even both of them in the finals. Uh, and so there are those kinds of things. Now, I want to give people a little visual because um, I remember you calling me one day and you said, yeah, I'm just about to call Scott, you know, calling Scotty tomorrow or something to start talking about the playoffs. And you uh, were like... Yeah. But this, this book you worked on in a really interesting way. So when you say you're talking to Scotty about all this, mm -hmm. paint a picture of what that looks like. Well, we didn't know what it was going to look like. I mean, that we, we just were going to start talking. And, and, uh, and, he, and he lives half the year in a suburb of Buffalo. Uh, and he lives half the year in Florida, near Sarasota. And so, um, uh, and again, I mean, the, it, it, like I don't even remember a day where we said to each other, okay, let's go, we're in. It was, it was like, well, let's start the conversation. And then, you know, the conversation never ended. I mean, it, was, it, it, you know, it could have ended in an hour or a week or something, but it just kept going. And so then the question was, well, how often would we talk and how would we do it? And I thought at first that, that I would be traveling a lot to Buffalo and a lot to Florida and, uh, um, but, you know, that we're going to start it over the phone. And, and so he happened to be in Florida at that time, and, uh, and I was in Toronto, so I was in my office in Toronto, and as, as it turns out, and after I visited him later, I realized where he, he was in, their, the kitchen of their condo, that's where he would be. And we decided, well, we're going to start, why not start on Monday, let's start at 9 in the morning. <laughs> so Let's we started at nine in the morning, you know, on the Monday. And Scotty always wanted to make the call uh, because then you know, he would be, you know, he would be able to set the timing, you know, of things. 
And, and, and we didn't know whether the conversation would go for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, four hours. We didn't know how long each time would fit. And we didn't know whether it would be once a week, twice a week, once every two weeks, whatever it was. And in the end, what it came to be is about an hour and a half. That was about you know, kind of the, the, the optimal amount of uh, uh, time. Uh, and it was Mondays and, and often Thursdays. But if something came up, if, if there was an illness, if, if uh, you know, his, his grandkids were visiting or something like that, then well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up you know, in a few days you know, instead of that. And then it just kind of went on, and it went on month after month and, and over a couple of years. And you have some binders at your disposal? Oh, yeah. Well, well this was you know, the, the, what we decided to do. As, I mean, Scotty remembers everything about everything. <laughs> um, uh, and what he doesn't remember, uh, well, and he probably remembers that he only uses this as a, as a check against his memory. And I didn't know this at the time. <laughs> but when he was in Toronto, or when he was in, in either Buffalo and most of the time in, in Florida, he had his, I, his iPad and his stylus. And he'd be there, and as, as we'd be talking, I had my laptop and my screen, and I thought I was the one, the only one, who would be checking something. On, he was also checking something on it. And, and as we were, like, Dickie Moore, was that in 63 or was that in 65? And did it, was it 18 goals or 32 or whatever it happened to be? And I'd be looking it up, and I'd be proud of how quickly I'd be on my screen and hockey DB and having the, or hockey reference. And, and Scotty goes, yeah, I think it was probably 18. And I go, oh, yeah, it was 18. <laughs> and, and it may well be that he remembered it was 18, but it may also Every be now that maybe. he was quicker <laughs> with his stylus than I was with my fingers. Um, and, that's, and, 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 and we would do it. And, and the thing that we discovered, and, 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 oh, yeah, and you mentioned the binders, and, and the <laughs> binder creator is here, Dan Diamond. But, I, but hey. Dan... Dan you know that that, <coughs> that did the NHL guide and record book for over 20 years, and and so I was asking him like, look, for these eight teams, I want as as complete statistics as exist. Well, for the 52 Red Wings, there's not a heck of a lot, uh, but over time, the statistical record is that much greater. The more statistics that are kept, and so that that you created. Uh, a set of binders for each of the teams. And so I would have a set, Scotty had a set, <laughs> and we would make reference you know, to those as well as we'd talk. And, and the thing that was great about having those, but then also having you know, the, the screens in front of us, is that essentially the conversation could go on without interruption. And if where instead yeah. of us being stuck by yeah. some statistic or something that we didn't recall, and that knowing the statistic kind of would mean, you know, whether the story went in this direction or in that direction, you know, within 10 or 15 seconds, we would have the answer and then the conversation could just continue on. Yeah. And, uh, and one, just one last thing about the nine o'clock thing, and this was- And it was always know, nine o'clock. It was always nine o'clock. And I have, I have my <laughs> digital watch here. And, and, and so, um, you know, that, that what I, after about, a few weeks of this, I, I, I knew what was going to happen. And, and, every, and, and I sort of <laughs> uh, set my, reset my watch every few weeks to the CBC time signal. <laughs> so, so I'm within a couple of seconds of being you know, right on all the time. Like you well, wait for the hour and then you do it? Like when they do it on the radio? Yeah, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> I use my iPhone and then change this. Oh, I'll admit. <laughs> Yours is better. Yeah. And, and, and so I, you know, the phone would ring. I would look down and on my digital watch, it would say, every, every time it would say nine colon zero zero something. In the, in the something was the, was the seconds. But it would always say 900. It never once said 859 or 901. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and what it was, and, and it was always the same thing. It was like, hi, Ken, it's Scotty. And, I, <laughs> and, and at first, you know, that, that was kind of useful information. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, but after yeah, the 10th yeah, call, after a there's while, really no question. <laughs> like, like, I had to go back, oh, hi, Scotty, <laughs> like, as if I was <laughs> surprised. <laughs> um, you talk about his memory, and we did an event. I had the really good fortune of doing an event with Ken and Scotty in the fall. And uh, I thought, you know, I would just reread the book in its finished version. I was really excited about it, and I wanted to ask one particular question about a season they shared together. I said, Scotty, you know, I was reading the book about this, this one game, and I kind of described it generally. And he goes, oh, yeah, that game. It was October 28th, 1977. We lost yeah. three to two. Yeah. And I was just like, what yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> like, an 86-year-old no. computer yeah. <laughs> in front no, of you. It's, no, it's really, like, and, and it's, like, I mean, any of you who know people who have been involved in sports, they, they will remember stuff like this. Yeah. I mean, they'll remember when they were 12 years old, and playing against so and so, and, and we lost three to two, and uh, you know that that one of our teammates shot it in our own net or something like that, um, and and but but it's the random game yeah. that 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 he will remember. I mean, a <laughs> totally nothing game, uh, you know, basically a nothing game at the time, you know, uh, in November the ninth, nineteen seventy three, or something. Yeah. And, 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 and there will be that recollection, you know, of, of that something happened then. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I start the book with a, with a story, which, <laughs> and, and I, I kind of, uh, usually I don't know much in advance of when I'm starting something, how something is going to begin. But I knew that this was the story to begin with, because what it did it allowed me at the end of the story to say, Scotty remembers everything about everything. And what the story was is that I was playing uh, junior B hockey. Uh, I played junior B hockey in Etobicoke. And, uh, and then after that, went to Cornell University. And we were, uh, so this was at Cornell, and it was our first year at Cornell, and it, and it it was a weekday, and I, I, I always thought it was a weekend, and this was, a, the fact checker was amazing. Found, discovered that it was on a Tuesday or a Wednesday <laughs> night. But anyway, one of, the, one of the nice things about living in Ithaca, New York, is that you can get New York TV stations. So we could get WPIX that, covered, that carried the Rangers games midweek. So this game is on, they're playing the St. Louis Blues, and I'm watching. And Glenn Hall is the goalie for St. Louis. And Glenn Hall, who is this great goalie, an incredibly nice, generous, calm guy, he has a moment. And, and he, he lets in a goal. He's not happy about letting in a goal early on. Uh, says something, gets a misconduct, and a game misconduct. So he's thrown out of the game with five minutes gone <laughs> in the first period. Well, in order to make, and I was telling you about the Jacques Plant, Glenn Hall yeah. part of it, in order to help make that work, is that the Blues would carry a third goalie, <clears throat> a young goalie, to dress as a backup each of the games that one of the older goalies was playing so that the other goalie could rest up in the press box, not have any you know, uh, stress on him. And so the backup, the third goalie, was, his name was Robbie Irons. And Robbie Irons had been my backup goalie for the Etobicoke Indians Junior B a couple of years before. And, and I'm down in Ithaca, New York, playing freshman hockey. And at that time, freshman hockey was not very good. Robbie Irons is skating out onto the ice <laughs> to play for the St. Louis Blues against the New York Rangers. And I'm watching this game. <laughs> and it's like, well, I can't believe it. Robbie Irons, there he is. And, and, and so what happens is that the part that I know is all of that, I'm watching, I'm amazed. Uh, and then about five minutes later, uh, that Jacques Plant skates out onto the ice. He, he, he comes down from the press box, uh, <laughs> gets dressed, and, and goes out onto the ice. And Robbie Irons goes off. He's relieved. That, yeah, that <laughs> yeah. was it. That was it. So that's the, that's the story I knew. The story, and, and that's a story I'm going to know because I know Robbie Irons and, and all of these other circumstances. Robbie Irons is probably one of 
5,000 players that Scotty Bowman has ever had. He was a third goalie, and he only played, you know, in, in the, at this particular moment. There's, so there's no way Scotty is going to remember Robbie Irons, let alone what he remembers. So <laughs> what he remembered that I didn't know <coughs> is that as soon as, as Glenn Hall is thrown out, then <coughs> Scotty is kind of like, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do now? Robbie Irons is sitting on the bench going, oh my God, what are we going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> All of the St. Louis Blues are going, oh my God, <laughs> we got 55 minutes to play. And as Scotty Rangers just, are happy. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and as, as Scotty would say, you know, Jacques Plante, who at this time in his career, and even at other times in his career, only wanted to play when he wanted to play. And this was a night that he didn't want to play. <laughs> and he was quite happy up in the press box. So as Scotty would, you know, recalls, this, and Jacques is taking his sweet time you know, coming down from the press box, going into the locker room, getting his equipment. Well, meanwhile, everybody is sort of waiting around. Well, Doug Harvey, this is another one of Scotty's reclamation. You know, and by this time, Doug Harvey's 42 years old. He hasn't played in the NHL for four years. And he was this great defenseman of the Montreal Canadiens. And so, but he's this guy who just is this kind of, um, I was going to say, he's a commanding presence while having a look on his face as if he's just completely placid and not, not commanding, but, but just <laughs> in, you know, just in, in, in control. So apparently Doug Ar Harvey is on the ice and he sort of meanders over to the St. Louis bench and comes up to Scotty and just says, uh, Scotty, um, we don't want this guy to play, do we? <laughs> and Scotty was a little sort of, you know, like he was taken aback and he didn't say anything and Doug Harvey took that as the answer. So Doug Harvey skated slowly, slowly, as Doug Harvey would, slowly towards the St. Louis uh, net where Robbie Irons was now standing and he kind of comes up to Robbie and just sort of says something and then skates away and then Robbie is, is taking the warm-up shots. And so he takes one or two shots and then all of a sudden there's one right along the ice to the corner and Robbie Irons does the splits to stop it, throws himself on his back in agony <laughs> because he has torn a hamstring, <laughs> he has pulled a groin, he has broken his leg, whatever it is, I mean, he is dead on the ice. I mean, that, that he is gone. And so he's, he's just lying there. And, 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 and so then, and, and, as, and then as Scotty is saying, and Jacques is still taking his sweet time. <laughs> oh God. Well then, Robbie can only <laughs> lie around the ice so long, and then the referee is getting a little impatient. And so the referee is saying, look, you know, we're, we got to start this game. Who's going to play goal? <laughs> and Scotty is still looking around for Jacques Plante. <laughs> Jacques Plante is still probably up in the press box. So anyway, that, that, that Robbie Irons, because there is no other option at this moment, sort of, oh, he just struggles to his feet. And I mean, he's in agony, but somehow with all of his broken and torn and twisted and <laughs> <laughs> limbs, he gets onto his feet and he sort of props himself there and, and the game begins. And so and he's out there and he, and he plays, I can't even remember what it is, it's either three minutes or five minutes. Um, and finally Jacques Plant appears. <laughs> and Jacques then comes onto the ice, Robbie Irons leaves the ice, and that was the the, the only five minutes that Robbie Irons ever played in his National Hockey League career, and his career goals against the average is 0 0.00. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. And, and Scotty, who had no right to remember any of that, remembered all of it. Every that. detail. <laughs> and I promise like that is, that is a microcosm for the experience of reading this book. It's just packed with so many amazing stories.